Welcome to this YouTube channel. In this video we are going to talk about social media in jury selection, good or bad. So before starting this video like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel for future updates. When social media sites became prominent in the early 2000s, human contact and socializing became totally transformed. Just 5% of the adult population of the United States used social media in 2005, 15 years later, the figure has risen to about 80%. Social media has evolved from a commodity to a need in many aspects of American life. The majority of people use Facebook to keep track of their relatives and friends' birthdays, Twitter to keep up with their favorite sports teams, and LinkedIn has become a requirement for finding a career or even getting into graduate school. Platforms like Facebook and Twitter have infiltrated almost every part of our lives. Because of these outlets, Americans have been very accessible with total strangers. Some people in the United States don't keep their social media pages secret. In the opposite, many people seem to love posting and tweeting about their lives, their preferences, likes, dislikes, values, and convictions. Prior to social media, most people did not express their views for the world to see. However, they held their opinions to themselves, and only those nearest to them became aware of them. Such trial lawyers may also recruit detectives to track some jurors around, and gather evidence to gain insight into their life in order to decide, whether or not they would be good jurors on their lawsuit. Prior to social media, anytime anyone publicly expressed a viewpoint or imposed their views or ideals on others, it offered a wealth of knowledge for other people. If someone picketed an abortion clinic every weekend, for example, one might infer that the person was religious, likely conservative, and likely a Republican with strong anti-abortion views. However, in today's world of social media, these viewpoints are not as strong or reliable. Someone may retweet a tweet from President Donald Trump about election fraud. What exactly does this imply? Could this imply that they support Trump? Could this imply that they believe in conspiracies? Does this imply that they find Trump's tweets amusing and want to share them with their own fans who may not be aware of them? What if the same person supports Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, Joe Biden, and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? It's become more difficult to decipher what this data means. We've only seen a few data points on actual Americans in the past. However, because of the widespread use of social media, we now have access to tens of thousands of data points. However, we now have a new issue to deal with. Which data points are really important, and which are only noise that contributes to erroneous and troublesome outcomes? Social media has shown to be useful in targeting particular people for ads and sales, but should it be used in more specific ways such as jury selection and deselection? Now we'll talk about the benefits and drawbacks of social media history analysis for jury selection, as well as some alternatives. Pros. Number 1. Quick and easy the biggest benefit of using social media to do background checks on prospective jurors is that it is a fast and painless way to learn more about the people who may be on your jury. Many states do not encourage lawyers to learn the identities of their jurors until a day or two before voir dire. The plaintiff's lawyers will have very little opportunities to gather information about prospective jurors is a result of this. Data from social media will give at least some extra input into the jury. However, the bulk of what you will discover during this period will be small, and the majority of your efforts will be focused on ensuring that the John Smith you are investigating is an exact match to the one in your jury pool. Number 2. Accurate Base Information The findings of social media analysis can be very reliable. The majority of the data gathered from social media analysis were based on two factors, demographics and religious views. Age, ethnicity, political party, and even occupations can all be found reasonably quickly and reliably through social media searches. It may also provide insight into the prospective jurors' views, such as whether they are pro-life or pro-choice, and whether they are for or against same-sex marriage. Owing to the fact that the majority of people prefer to follow social conventions, these views are typically strongly related to religion, and are somewhat accepted beliefs rather than being seen as radical or taboo. This indicates they would most certainly not express radical views, but rather those that are shared by their community and friends. As a result, conservatives can publicly discuss negative views of abortion, positive views of gun ownership, and other issues related to their political or religious beliefs. However, they are unlikely to express radical or taboo views, such as 9-11 being a government-promoted conspiracy theory, or that far-left groups are secret agents for the Russian government. 
However, this does not rule out the existence of those people, and social media can be useful in weeding out those who hold extremist views. Number 3. Cheap. Social media analysis on prospective jurors can be relatively inexpensive in most cases, but not always. It should be simple and easy to complete, and it should be a less costly way to access basic context information. If you have a person's name and address, there are a multitude of agencies that can provide quick information about them. This low-cost, fast detail, however, will be limited. The information given can tell you about their interests, shopping habits, and voting choices, but it doesn't go into great detail about their attitudes, prejudices, or convictions. This basic knowledge can also be collected internally by the tech-savvy employees. It is very easy to carry out and should not be anything for which you spend a large amount of money. Number 4. Jurors expect it. Adults in the United States have been accustomed to having their social media pages used to measure them. You should expect a new boss to look at your social accounts as you apply for a position. Expect someone to look you up when you go on a date. Expect old classmates or family members who haven't talked to you in a long time to check in on you via social media rather than calling. Social networking has become an extension of its members and has become rooted in our culture. According to studies, the majority of jurors are cool with prosecutors looking at their social media pages. They are somewhat prepared for it. Most people should not consider it invasive or problematic. It is just the rule, as seen in the examples above. Number 5. Can be done in-house. Unlike more sophisticated means of investigating jurors, social media audits should be carried out in-house. The most challenging job is perfectly matching the prospective juror with the social media site you are investigating. Almost everyone knows how to scan social media. This is easier to do if you first look at more accessible social media sites, such as LinkedIn. You will match your fundamental knowledge to the other social media sites if you have it. However, with the latest rise of more modern privacy environments, neither an outside source, nor your own staff can be able to obtain any information at all, if the jurors are diligent in protecting their privacy. Cons. Number 1. Subjective results. Outside of demographics and certain religious views, the knowledge you collect becomes very arbitrary. Someone might say they're voting for Trump on social media, but that doesn't tell you much about them. Voting for a candidate does not indicate that you agree with their viewpoints. It's possible they're afraid of the consequences of opting for the other primary nominee. It's possible that Trump shares their personal views, and that's the only reason they voted for him. This will cause you and your team to place an undue emphasis on arbitrary data points. Number 2. Privacy Problems The lack of a social media identity and the use of anonymous social media is now the trend. Five years ago, social media was very free and honest. Facebook offered a wealth of material in the form of articles and messages that people freely exchanged. Twitter presented users with brief perspectives on subjects, as well as retweets for those who had valuable feedback. Photographs of jurors holding Confederate flags or photographs of controversial figures may be found on Instagram. However, due to the recent rise in privacy concerns, the majority of social media users have increased their privacy settings or have entirely abandoned the platform. As a consequence, the findings of these forms of studies are sporadic and inaccurate. Furthermore, people with extremist viewpoints are more likely to post on an anonymous site rather than their own private social media site. Number 3. Some courts may not approve of the tactic. Unlike the options some judges and courts consider social media research on jurors to be illegal. As social media becomes more popular and ubiquitous, this seems to be becoming less and less common. It's important to be upfront with the court on this strategy, and whether they deem it immoral or invasive, the supporting evidence for purpose may suffer. Number 4. Weak and messy data. Social network evidence is simply unreliable from a methodological perspective. It is the most basic type of data, much like context data. It's a wonderful place to start gathering facts, but you shouldn't depend on it exclusively to make decisions. It's like measuring a book by its cover if you just use social media. On social media, not everyone presents themselves as they do in real life. For this data to be truly useful, a much deeper dive is needed. It can serve as a starting point, but it should not be the primary focus of the jury selection process. Regrettably, social media data was still highly disorganized. This indicates that the information is not straightforward and cannot be readily classified or valued. When anyone responds to a post with, that is awesome, it can be taken as either encouragement for the post or sarcastically responding to the post. 
What do you think about this video? Do let us know down in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video and want to hear from us again, be sure to hit that subscribe button before you go.